So we are back at the Broncolo studio. Welcome. Good morning. I saw that some of you are actually in Tokyo. So very good morning, very good early morning to Tokyo and all the way to Fort Lauderdale. So I think it's very exciting that uh, I have the chance to talk to you to the entire world from east to west. Um, very quickly, um, let me give you a uh, know you where we are in these uh, webinars and then especially what's going to happen today. So this is webinar number nine out of 10. So we ran eight already. This is number nine and it's an odd number. This means it's a product inside today. So no live shooting. I will talk about uh, Bronco products. This time not uh, monolites or power packs, but light shapers. Special light shapers and special lamps. Starting with the small ones, Pico light with all the accessories, continuing with strip light, light stick, box light, all these kinds that are of light shapers that are more used for, um, let's say, still life photography, very precise light shapers. Then we increase the size a little bit of these light shapers. The balloon, the, the one that you cannot see right now in the in the picture, later on, light stick, as mentioned before, light pipe, pulse spot for very nice light. And in the end, we end up with the biggest one. So from the smallest one to the biggest one, which is the Para triple two in the background. So that's what uh, what's going to happen today. Um, I will make uh, groups of uh, discussing three, four light shapers, and uh, between these groups, uh, I will have a quick uh, look at the questions in the chat. So if you have any questions uh, related to what we are talking about today, so special light shapers and special lamps, please ask this uh, in the chat. Uh, my colleague will uh, have a look at these questions, answer some of them, and um, uh, a few questions, a selection of questions I will get here on the screen and answer them live. Um, we will do as well a, a last uh, round of questions at the very end. However, if for any reason your question is not answered today, uh, be aware that I will be back here in the studio on Friday afternoon, 2 p.m. Swiss time um, on the Broncolor Instagram channel and answer that all your questions about lighting live during an Instagram live session. All right, and then let's say the, the end of, the, of this webinar series will happen uh, in one week from now. So next Wednesday afternoon or morning, depending where you are, I will be back here in the studio and talk about the commercial photography. I don't know yet what I will be shooting, but it will be a product shot with uh, probably reusing or re-showing some of these uh, light shapes that are around today. And it's gonna be a live shot to end the series, right? So what's going to happen today? Um, as I said, I start with the Pico light, then we increase the size until we end up with the para. Pico light is here. Um, it's called small light. Why is it interesting? Why is it important that we have a small light? It's very essential to have uh, absolute control about our light that we actually shrink the size of the light shaper or the lamp head to the size of our object. Um, one good example is just standing here. Let me grab this quickly. So just from, let's say, um, when I shoot advertising for Broncolor, let's say one of the subjects, of course, are the Cirrus lights, the Cirrus S or the Cirrus L. And uh, we wanted to show as well a little bit uh, in one photograph, the, the details, the design details here of the, of the handle and of course of the, the, the black writing and all this. And in this situation, I wanted to have a very controlled light on a very small area. So we are talking here about maybe five by 10 centimeters. So how can I control the light on a sm super small area, like just a few centimeters? If I try to do this with a normal reflector, even with the most narrow grids, narrow honeycomb grids, the light that, that's coming out between my two hands is even. So this means even with the most narrow grids, this entire area would be evenly lit. No chance to create the tiny spotlights, precise spotlights, gradations on a small area. This works perfectly if I have a background of uh, several meters or a, a full body shot to illuminate with grids only the top of the body and to, to create the gradations towards the legs. Works fine because this is a lot smaller than a full body shot, but it has like 
triple the size of my object here. And in this situation, I lose completely control. That's why we do not reinvent honeycomb grids. We just shrink them down in size. So for example, we have now the grid, which is more or less of the size of the setup. We pre-shape the light by using a snoot, but there's nothing in yet, so that the light is already, the light angle is already kind of limited. Then I throw the grids in. If this is not precise enough, I have the option to limit the light angle even more with an aperture mask. So here we have a diameter of maybe three centimeters. I throw this in as well, and the spring keeps it in position. I put it on, fix it, clock. That's it. And now I have a super tiny, small honeycomb grid that allows me to illuminate here re really just a couple, uh, an area which is just a few centimeters wide. Um, how will this happen today? How will I talk about the light? I don't. I will not have the time or the chance to shoot live, but. I shot a lot of pictures before, and I always would like to explain the light shaper first, but then as well to demonstrate or to let you see in photographs, in already existing photographs, what I mean. And that's what we are doing now. I would like to show you a couple of photographs that I've taken with the Picolite and the Honeycomb grids. So I open these in Photoshop, and I'm going to share the screen you that you can see what I try to explain. So that's just uh, the photograph, just checking if it shows up. Not Yes, there it comes. Okay, so it's the photograph I just explained before. So you see that this is the, the, the highlight. This is the this spot effect and this is created with the, the, the pico light and with the narrow grids and the aperture mask. So I have the chance with this precise tool to create here a gradation from the full focus of the light, the full brightness to completely black. Okay, with any other light shapers, this will not be possible or I have to improvise a lot with flags and cardboards and so on and so on. But here the light is out of the lamp head, ready to use super, super precise. Um, I can show you a different object. Let's say um, here, the, this is the setup of just a, a white egg on a white background. Uh, as again, with the Pico light and the narrow honeycomb grids and the final results look, uh, looks like this. So you see, um, you know how big uh, an egg is. So as well with this precise tool, I have the chance to control the illumination of this egg very, very precisely. Um, this is just one example out of 50 examples from an ebook that we recently um, produced. And you can actually download this ebook for free via Broncolor social media. Um, you, can, you, you find the link on the Broncolor Instagram as well as on the Broncolor Facebook channel. It's absolutely for free. And it shows you 50 photographs photographs of eggs, not only with uh, special light shapers and always the corresponding uh, behind the scenes shot and just a couple of uh, sentences explaining this specific uh, light shaper and why I used it in this specific situation. So download this, it's absolutely free and hopefully it makes you as much fun to read it as it was for me to shoot it. Then let me just open the next couple of photographs, which are actually just one. Here, um, a flower in a glass, and this now is not shot with the honeycomb grid. Um, here I use the Fresnel spot attachment for the Pico light. Why did I use this? Because I wanted to have a very fast fall off of the light once the, the light reaches the, the end of the light angle. So the gradation here at the end of the flower to the to the stick of the flower, this gradation is super, super fast. And this is typical to a Fresnel spot. It, uh, so the edge transfer is sharper with a Fresnel compared to the edge transfer with a honeycomb grid. The other reason why we, um, let me unshare the screen again quickly. 
Uh, the other reason why you probably would prefer to go with the Fresnel spot attachment compared to the um, honeycomb grids is the power. Honeycomb grids, they are focusing the light by burning the light that tries to go left and right out of my light shaper. So the, let's say this uncontrolled light that uh, wants to illuminate a bigger area than what I actually want it to. So we are focusing the light by, by destroying some of the light. However, um, the Fresnel spot works differently. The light that tries to go left and right is not destroyed. It's redirected to the, to the center. So using the, the Fresnel spot, you're actually using all the light uh, produced by the, the Pico light, and you have a higher light output. So most of the time, Pico light is used on the rather small sets, food photography, jewelry photography, small, um, as I showed before, small um, product shots. But um, for example, this, uh, this beautiful small spot is a super uh, sharp line as well for, for beauty photography, even for fashion. And then all of a sudden we are maybe two, three meters further away. And then of course, I'm very happy if I have a little bit more light output. The, the opening here, that's actually from the physical point of view, quite interesting what we did here. I hope you can see this. Yeah, you can see this, I think like that in this angle. So the opening here is, is quite small. Okay, so we only actually, actually let in the, the center of the light. So almost like a point light source. So we have, we convert the, the flash tube into a point light source because if we have a point light source, the lens is as accurate and as precise as possible. So the focus is here definitely on the light quality and less on the light quantity. As I said, most of the time we use it over rather short distances. So that's why the main focus is here on the light quality. It's super nice, super even, super precise. It's a very nice small spot for small sets. If the precision of these two spots, Honeycomb Grid and Fresnel is not sufficient, we have another accessory which is much more precise in fact and uh, this is the projecting attachment so it's not it's like this kind of uh, unprecise lens like a, a fresnel lens it's really an optical system here like like a like a camera lens and that's as well why we have a much higher lighting uh, light quality besides this it works exactly the same you put it on fix it so it can't fall off and then uh, we we close here the or we close it on the side. It has here templates. We have four templates, and with these templates, we can actually create and project any shape of light that we need. So, if you're just, for example, if you shoot a black object on a black background and you cannot separate um, the object from the background, this could be a solution by just illuminating just a few pixels wide. The, the rim of the object just to separate it from the background. Super, super precise tool. I don't have um, all the lights here in the studio. I do, uh, well, I have a couple of uh, lampades, of course, Pulsar G, Uni lights are around. And let's say from the Pico light, I have everything at least once of this baby. I even have two. So I have two Pico lights and two project attachments because I really uh, use them basically. Um, mostly on a daily basis, especially when I shoot um, precise details of our products. Again, I would like to let you see a couple of photographs that um, explains why this is such a nice thing. So first of all, again, two examples from the book. Let me open these pictures. Okay, I made it wrong again, like this morning. So let me correct this quickly. Sorry for that. I don't want to store it. Okay. And I want to open these two photographs, pull them here and share the screen. Right, here we go. The first picture again, as I said, is from this uh, book. So here, when, when I showed this picture, when I actually po uh, posted it on on Instagram, for example, a lot of people asked me, "How did you how did you manage to have the the, the front of the egg so dark? Did you did you retouch it, or what did you, did you do? Did you use flags? 
No, I just used the PicoLite with the projecting attachments and with the integrated templates. So I just used a very narrow beam of light, a very sharp etched narrow beam of light that only illuminates the egg from one side, but that the, the belly of the egg is actually in the shadow, is out of this light beam. So that's why I get this very strange um, illumination of this egg. Again, out of the lamp head, no retouching done here by any of these photographs. But we are not shooting, let's say, eggs on a daily basis. Let's take something which is more, uh, more standard work, like, for example, we have to shoot a watch. Let's go back a little bit in the development of the photograph. So this is um, all the lights that I used for, for the chrome. So these are soft lights, these are soft boxes, these are acrylic plates. If you want to have the, if you want to read the entire story about this uh, Chopard watch shooting, again, you can go to our website, broncolor.swiss, you go to the learn section, and there you can read, I don't know, it's like 10 pages where I uh, describe very precisely how I shot three different um, photographs of this same watch. So the chrome part here is actually solved quite nicely, but the background is dead. So here did this, this rock, this stone in the background is dead. And as well, uh, this area, the center area uh, of the watch as well is dead, doesn't show any texture. And there, the projecting attachment of the PicoLite in combination with the round aperture masks, uh, mask solves the problem. So it allows me to illuminate only this very small, specific point to bring a lot of life into, um, to create a lot of texture. If we zoom in here, yeah, maybe here we, with Photoshop, we could solve it somehow a little bit. But again, if I attach, if I use this Pico light with the projecting attachment uh, and illuminate the center area with a very hard light, very precise light, then I, it, uh, the texture comes much more alive. I can feel the blue, I can feel the texture. So it's uh, definitely the much better photograph like that. And then in the end, I added as well a little bit of light uh, to the background, to this stone, to show the texture of the stone. Otherwise, it would be just completely dead like this because all the lights uh, that I use for the chrome are soft lights or graduated lights, uh, not good for texture. And there's just another Pico light again with projecting attachment hitting the background. So that's um, why I really love this uh, little choker in the studio, solves me a lot of uh, photographical issues. Right, for those that are that want to see the entire set. So this is how the entire set looks like. So the main light is um, a normal reflector with uh, narrow grids to create the gradations on, on the chrome parts. Then the, the re reflectors left and right and the white paper around just illuminate as well some parts of the chrome. And then important, the, the pico light just below the camera is actually the one that's responsible for the, the, the blue center and the, the pico light coming from the left uh, as well with the projecting attachment is responsible for the texture of the stone. In the end, it looks uh, quite simple, uh, this setup, uh, but believe me, it's um, it's five to six hours work and moving uh, things millimeter wise. Again, if you want to read the entire article, it's you find it on the Bronkler website. So I'm sharing the screen to let you see the next light shaper, which is the last one for the, the Pico light family. It's the Pico box. Um, it's super, it's a small soft box. It's just about a, a 10 by 50, uh, 25 centimeters high. So um, very small and extremely evenly lit. I don't want to show this again, but if you look inside, we have uh, counter reflectors here that are spreading the light inside. Uh, via the, the, the white inner coating. We have intermediate diffusers like in our textile soft boxes. So like this, we managed to have the illumination of the front diffuser um, within one tenth of an f-stop only. So in the center, we have one tenth of an f-stop more than, on the, uh, than in the corners, which is extremely, uh, extremely even. It's narrow for again, for, for the same reason. 
if I illuminate, um, let's say, a, a small shiny object and I would like to create clean, sharp highlights and I go there with a softbox, it's just a, a complete overkill. It would illuminate the entire scene, it would um, destroy the contrast and everything. So even with area light, it's important that we actually shrink it down. And we went for a hard diffuser, okay, not for a, for a textile solution. And of course, these um, they will not show any wrinkles. They will not. Uh, they will be super super clean, even if the highlights are not burnt. Let's say if you see the highlight of a softbox in an eye, and this uh, this highlight is slightly burned, it's just white. You won't see the the wrinkles and so on. But if we Let's say take the exposure a little bit down and we just want to create a nice highlight on, on a beer glass or on a bottle. We should not burn this highlight. So we take it down. It's not actually white. It's just a bright gray. And this means that if the light shaper is wrinkled or uneven, we would immediately see this. It would create a dirty, not nice looking highlight on our shiny object. So that's why this is... Um, Yes, super, super clean and extremely even. Um, a question that I'm regularly asked is, what is this or that light shape for? And my honest answer is always, it's for photography. So obviously, Pico light, as mentioned before, is the general idea is to use it on small setups, like fruit photography, jewelry photography, watches photography, uh, bottles and so on and so where, where we really have to control the light to the last pixel. But why not try such an accessory as well on a beauty shot, on a portrait? Using equipment differently and not, not the normal way always pushes us as photographers to open our eyes to see does it actually work on the face or is it just a very bad idea? And that's what I like to do a lot. So I use, let's say, still life tools on a portrait and i like to use fashion tools like the para on still life this always pushes me to have a look at the photograph to have a look at the light to decide is it looking good do i want this effect or not and like this i can actually break the rules and find new ways of lighting so let me show what i mean with this first of all i'm going to open here a portrait that i shot uh, with this um Pico box. It's a it's a black and white portrait, single light. Yes, there we are. If I zoom in on the eyes, you see it. Okay, so it's just the the Pico box. The the, the little black, actually grayish uh, paper there. That's just a black cardboard that uh, protects the camera. Otherwise, the the light. Um, hits the, the front lens and we have a lot of uh, flare. So this is just, uh, this has nothing to do with the lighting. It's just protecting my, my camera. Uh, because the Pico box is so extremely narrow, it's more narrow than, than the head. And if I take it, uh, if I use it the narrow way round as well. So this means it's, it's slimmer than the head itself. That's why I get beautiful gradations to both sides. Those that have been attending a lighting seminar with me, they know that I can do this as well differently. Let's say with uh, angling or uh, tilting away a softbox from the side. But in this situation, we have the light symmetrically coming vertically down. And because of the narrow size of the light shaper, I can achieve, let's say, like the same effect of uh, darker contours to both sides of the face, which is, of course, shaping the object, which is her beautiful face uh, very, very Nicely. All right, good. Going back to uh, to the egg iBook that you can download here as well. I would like to show you the egg as well. Here I use a different technique. So the light is obviously coming from the right side, but nevertheless, we have here actually a light fall off. And now this light fall off is created by tilting the Pico box away. So the, so, uh, the setup looks like this so i tilted it away and because we have an acrylic uh, front diffuser this of course is absolutely flat it's not like the sometimes the little bounced belly of a textile softbox because of the ventilation of the lamp heads so it's much more precise than, than, a, than a softbox and by tilting it by feathering it away a little bit i can very nicely create a very three-dimensional look 
um, here on, on this object. As a fill-in light, I, uh, all the 50 shots of the iBook are shot with one single light, no, um, no additional light shapes in this situation, just a mirror from the other side that uh, the egg is not fading away into a complete black. So this light here on the other side is actually coming from the mirror. Right. So on sharing the screen. So this was the small family. I would like to show you three more, which is the Pico, no, not the Pico, Pico we have done, which is the box light 40, the strip light and the light stick. And after this, I'm going for a first round of questions. So if you have any questions about, especially about these small light shapers, it's now already the, the moment to, to type them in and I will be able to answer them hopefully later. So next one is the box light 40. 40 is indicating the size of it. So it has um, 40 centimeter, it's, it's high. I would like to give you a comparison to the Pico box, which is uh, like uh, 25 centimeters. So it's already somewhat bigger. Nevertheless, it's almost as even as the Pico box. In here, it's not too thick, it's quite narrow. Uh, we have two linear flash tubes, so not the normal round flash tubes, but linear flash tubes. The inner coating is completely white, a lot of diffused light. That's why we have it very, very evenly uh, illuminated um, as well. There is no edge. All right, so on the Pico box, we have the frame actually holding the, the front diffuser in position. This is not the case here. So if you have it and if you need it, you can add a second Pico, uh, no, a second box light 40 just next to this one and you will not see the, the rim. So there's actually um, light until the last millimeter, until the last pixel. And this is actually a nice feature if you kind of want to integrate the light in your photograph. I use it sometimes um, as a light table, uh, let's say, um, going through um, a bed of ice when I shoot ice-cooled drinks, or um, sometimes I throw, uh, let's say, flowers or other objects into a bath of, uh, of milk. You will see a picture of this uh, later on. And this is the perfect under light. So if you would like to have a flashing light table, that's the solution because it's acrylic, of course, as well. It's stable. It's always 100% flat and super, super evenly lit. Let me show you a couple of photographs done with this box light. Um, I have here four of them. Let me open them and share the screen. Okay, that's the one. Share and we should be, okay, don't want to start here. I want to start here. So again, my egg, Picolite, no. Why do I say Picolite all the time? Because I, I love them so much probably. Boxlight 40 in the set, the result looks like this. So super sharp, super clean edge, absolutely evenly lit and no other lights. So the, the light of the, the Boxlight 40 wraps around the egg quite nicely. That's one of the examples that illustrates how it can be used as a light table. So here again, no other light, just the flowers on the box light 40, taking care of a precise exposure that the, these leaves here at the edge are just not burnt. Okay, that are very light. Some of the light is coming through, but they are not burnt. And then of course, I get the nice three dimensionality like with the egg because I have no additional light from the front. And again, why not use this still life tool for portrait photography? So this beauty shot is done with the box light. Now in this situation, the light comes actually from the right side, but then again, it's um, feathered away. It's more directed towards the camera and less to the model directly. That's why I have a light fall off here to the right. So the, this highlight, the first one on the right side, this is actually the, the box light, super sharp, super precise. And the second highlight is uh, just a cardboard that fills in the light a little bit or fills in the shadows a little bit. Right, so this is about the box light. Then we have the strip light. 
again, I would like to show you this light shape first. Strip light 60, again, the number indicates the size of it. So it is, it is of course, somewhat larger. I have to watch out, otherwise I destroy everything here. All right. So it's somewhat larger, of course, than the, the box light 40, about 20 centimeters, but it's much more narrow. So it's in the end, it's softer in one way, but it's more precisely and harsher in, in the horizontal uh, direction right now. It has as well linear flash tubes, and this um, guarantees the absolute even illumination, like all the other acrylic um, boxes we have. Um, yes, and as I said, it's, it's acrylic as well, so it's, it's, uh, it's hard. It has a very precise light angle of exactly 100 degrees, and regardless, of the ventilation, it always um, keeps the exact same um, same light angle. Examples with the strip light. I have a few of them. Let me open all of them at the same time to win a little bit of time. I want to share Photoshop again with you. All right, so. The first one is this detail of a, of a scorer power pack with, with the plug. Now, if I would illuminate this scene with a larger light shaper, just a softbox or even the box light 40, I would never get this kind of nice gradations. Okay, so here you can actually see that the three dimensionality, you can see that this part of the, of the plug is actually round. And um, I could try to get this effect, of course, um, as well with a spotlight, let's say with a pico light, with a Fresnel. But if you look a little bit further down in the photograph, these highlights, these are the highlights of an area like, like a softbox or something like this. So it is the perfect combination of being a long light, like 60 centimeters, that allows me to illuminate such shiny areas that actually um, very precisely and very dominantly show the design elements of this product in combination with a light that creates, due to the hardness, due to the, the, the crispiness of the light, creates a lot of three-dimensionality in the shot. So it's a very nice combination. The same here. Here again, I tilted the, the strip light a little bit towards the camera. That's why I, that's how I created here degradations on the handle. Here, um, that's what I said. So it's backlit. It's a, a fish tank with milk in it. And the milk is mixed a little bit with water. Then below, a box light 40 that actually illuminates the, the entire bath of milk. And then from the top and from below to strip lights, 60. And because these, these lights are so narrow, I can, if I just put them on the same level like the, the flower itself, it allows me to have here dark areas that actually show the three-dimensionality of the object very nicely. And if I get shiny or if I have shiny areas somewhere in the shot, like here, the highlight uh, on the milk, of course, these highlights are super sharp, super clean, very, very nice. Um, I can equip the strip light with honeycomb grids. You can see them mounted here. And then, of course, the, the light angle is uh, dominantly uh, reduced to about 40 degrees. And it's uh, normally it has, of course, 180 degrees. And this, of course, limits the light angle to about 40 degrees. And I can have a, a kind of a spot effect, but uh, it's not a spot effect from normal reflector. Actually, it's a diffused light, which light angle is later on reduced. Last but not least, it's the same what I explained before with the detail of the power pack, this detail of a perfume bottle. Because it's so narrow, I manage, with the, playing with the position, I manage that the, the cap of this perfume bottle is nicely round. So here it starts dark, then we have a highlight, another dark area because the, the, the strip light is far in the back, another light, and uh, here another darker area, another gradations towards dark. If you see this, you will probably try to achieve this lighting with two spots, one on the left and one on the right. But again, you would never get these highlights here on the cap here and up here that perfectly. 
okay with, with with spotlights these would be two two probably burnt out spots uh, somewhere on on the cap but uh, this combination of being soft enough for shiny areas and precise enough for textured areas this is re really something unique to the strip light if you look at the background of the photograph that's actually done with the light stick and that's the last light shaper i would like to explain just before i answer the first round of questions let me open this first uh, light stick and i show it to you later on how it actually looks like okay there we go so the light stick we start with a different one i start with this one is just a linear flash tube um, has no modeling light by the way so it's super super harsh no diffuser really just a linear flash tube extremely hard in one direction because the flash tube is only about one one centimeter wide but then it's about 40 centimeters long so it's more extreme than the the strip light because the the, the ratio between long and the, the height is more extreme here um, and this is how it how it would look like so it's on one side horizontal it's quite soft so that's why it wraps around the egg actually quite nicely but then up here a very sharp uh, a very sharp um, transition into black as well especially on this area working out a lot of texture and then again a little bit of reflections from um, from the left side with uh, a mirror if i put it in front of the egg but as well below the table because it's so very precise it's extremely hard it's uh, yeah as i said it's the the, the size of the light is just one centimeter so i can put it just below the table that the light hits the egg but nothing else so i can create very mystical very um interesting lighting situations and last but not least because it's such a very hard light i can use it to to work out reflective surfaces like this um anturium flower uh, maybe you know it is very very shiny it almost looks like plastic and if i want to see this in the photograph it doesn't make sense if i use a softbox with it uh, for it because it would just um, make it uh, make a, a red mess in this situation so here the main light is definitely a light stick and all these reflections these very harsh reflections are caused by the light stick this is something just you would probably just try to do the opposite with a portrait but you would try to avoid these kind of reflections so you would rather go for a soft box for a diffused light but here i want to emphasize the shine of the surface so i go for a very very hard light and there the light stick is one of my favorite choices okay let me show you the light stick and then we are or i'm ready for the first round of questions so that's how it looks like um as i said about 40 centimeters wide it comes when you order it it comes with a with a reflector so you can actually direct the light a little bit but most of the time like uh, in this example with the flower i take the reflector away and just use it as a linear flash tube okay good uh, it has a double heat protection so you can even uh, hold it in your hand you can uh, put it very close to your model you can even put it let's say if you shoot the interior of a car it's one of the um, as well the preferred purposes of a light stick that you hide it somewhere in a fridge or under the seat of a car to illuminate areas that you cannot reach with light differently it, it has a double heat protection so you can put it as well on rather sensitive uh, surfaces and you will not uh, burn or damage them so that's actually the way i use this light stick most of the time just as a bare heat protected linear flash tube okay so now it's the moment to have a look at the, the chat and the questions that are filtered out of this hello i hesitate between purchasing a fresnel spot attachment and pulso attachment do you have any comp uh, comparative images examples okay between a fresnel spot attachment and the spot attachment okay uh, these are two completely different lights the spot attachment is an optical system 
The spot attachment is this one, okay, but um, for the, the Pulsar G or for the Unilights. However, the Fresnel attachment, of course, is a Fresnel spot. So if you want to have or if you need to project a gobo or um, any pattern on a background or on an object, then you have to go for an optical system, which means the, the spot attachment. However, if you would like to have a precise spot, let's say more precise than honeycomb grids, then you go to, for the Fresnel. What I have to say about the uh, spot attachment, it has not the same sharpness like the Pulsar Spot 4 what, that we will see later on. It has not the same sharpness um, like uh, the projecting attachment for the Pico Light. But it's, uh, I, can't, I cannot answer the question like this. So the, the spot attachment is an optical system projecting a picture of the light source. It can work with different gobos uh, and so on, while the other one is just a Fresnel, but of course the Fresnel lens is never as sharp to project um, any patterns on the background. Yes. Okay, yes, I just heard that the, the volume is a little bit too high, so I take it slightly, slightly down. Thank you for this input. Um, how, does the, uh, how does the strip light differ from the light bar? The light bar has a different um, diffuser, so the, the strip light is flat. Okay, the light bar, the, the, the housing here or the, the diffuser is, we uh, take it away, and then you put an acrylic round diffuser on. So what, when the light bar has a light angle of exactly 180 degrees and a flat diffuser, uh, sorry, the, the strip light has a flat diffuser and a light angle of exactly 180 degrees, the light bar has a round diffuser, okay, and the light angle of close to 360 degrees. So like uh, 350 degrees, just the area behind the light bar actually remains in the dark. Um, so it is, uh, in a way, it's much more uncontrolled, the light bar, because it has a much wider light angle, but to create, for example, to create gradations on acrylic plates, uh, most photographers would prefer the light bar. Um, with the honeycomb grid on the Pico light, can we get a sharp edge on the shadow? Um, more or less, I mean, uh, on, on the shadow, yes, of course, sorry. The, the edge transfer is not as sharp as with a Fresnel, but imagine the size of the light. The size of the light source is just, or can be just this. So of course the shadow, especially over short distances, when, you, when you're shooting food or if you have an object on the table, the, the distance from the object to the, uh, to the background, to the table is extremely short. So the shadows, of course, are extremely sharp because the light shaper is small and the distance from the object to the background is small as well. So this um, is the explanation why we can definitely expect sharp shadows from this. Last question for now. Does it matter if you drop the aperture mask first or drop the honeycomb grid first? Um, from a light pointing uh, view, it does not. I always uh, make sure that I uh, that I treat my objects uh, nicely. So that's why I put in the aperture mask first. This is nothing else than a little bit of a front protection. I mean, the, the spring here does not really damage the grid, okay? But the, the grid here now is a little bit protected. So um, if you dr drop it somewhere, it's not the, the grid that's the front, it's actually the aperture mask that actually protects it. I think it makes um, I really take care of it when I put it away. I always make a sandwich with all the, the grids first and then the aperture mask in front and the aperture mask in the back protecting my grids. Okay, like this I throw them in. Spring and they're nicely protected. But from a lighting point of view, it does not matter at all. Good. Question window is empty, which means I go on with uh, slightly bigger light shapers. Time is running right crazy. Next one would be the balloon. Um, balloon just goes on normal lamp heads. And now this one has definitely a light angle of 360 degrees. So maybe there are just a few centimeters behind the, 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 uh, the lamp head that are actually remaining in the shadow. 
but the, the, the light shape is so big that this light easily travels around the light shape, so we really can expect a light angle of 360 degrees here. If we work with the balloon in a non-reflecting environment, let's say we are going out on the beach with it, it's, the light can be absolutely compared to uh, the round softbox, to an octagonal softbox of about the same diameter. So I don't really see a reason to, to take that the para, let's say, out of a studio or in, the, in a non-reflecting environment. But if you're inside, if you can deal with reflections from the walls, from the ceiling, from the floor, then the balloon makes a lot of sense. Um, because you can actually work um, with the reflections. For, following example, let's say if you have it, if you have the balloon just one meter uh, next to me, and then the the wall is maybe three meters away. This means that the the light that that hits the wall, it's uh, the wall is three times further away, so it has nine times less light. So I have about three f stops less light on the wall coming back to me. So I will have a very high contrast. However, if I move the balloon away from me, the direct light, of course, will be less. But in comparison to this, the indirect light via the walls and the ceiling and the floor will be more. So, in a reflective environment, the balloon is actually can be used as two lights, as a main light, the light that hits the object directly, and the indirect light via the reflective environment. Okay, good. I would, I have as well uh, photographs with the egg, but as we are definitely running out of time very fast, I think I leave it with this explanation, which is the, the most important part about it. Then, after the balloon, I think it makes sense that we talk about the light pipe. Light pipe is like a long balloon. But you can say, yeah, but it does not have a, a 360 degrees light angle. But you can have a 360 degrees light angle. Let's say if you would just like to have a light bar. So let's say now we are close to a light bar because it's a round diffuser. Okay. But if you would like to have more like a linear balloon, you take this away. This counter reflector that allows you to direct the light a little bit, you can take it away. And now we have, uh, of course, something similar to the light characteristics of a balloon, because you have a light angle of almost 360 degrees all around. But it's linear compared to the balloon. So the light characteristic is a mixture between a strip light shape or a very narrow softbox and the balloon. But the handling is something completely new, because I can, let's say, have the, the, the lamp head is here. I mount the, the light pipe and I can hang it, let's say, over a table without needing a boom stand coming vertically down. Or let's say you have to shoot somebody, you have to shoot a portrait of somebody sitting in a car. So how do you get the softbox into the car? There's just not enough space. But with the light pipe, you can actually leave the, the lamp head and the stand outside of the car and you can insert the... Um, uh, the light pipe into the car and you can actually create there a very nice uh, portrait and of course by dealing uh, with indirect directions uh, reflections inside the car you can as well um, control the contrast so let's say if you only allow you use the, the black wrap and you you block all the light that wants to come uh, that wants to go up to the ceiling in the car and come back. If you block this, of course, you increase the contrast. If you take the, the black wrap around, you use it like a balloon, then you have a lot of indirect light uh, that you can use for, for fill-in. These indirect lights with the balloon and the, the light pipe, the, the indirect lights, so the fill-in lights, they have the same color like the environment. So if you have a warm tone interior of a car, for example, the, this diffused light that's coming back has the same color like the interior of the car, or even if you have colored the seat, let's say if there's a, in, in a sports car, let's say there's a red seat next to me. So there will be a little bit of red light being bounced back from the red seat next to it. So this makes the, the feeling light very atmospheric, very logical. It's not like adding another uh, daylight inside the car. This always can look a little bit synthetic. So the light of these two light shapes looks very, very synthetic because we work a lot with the indirect uh, controllable reflections on a reflective environment. Um, so I would like to show you a couple of, just a few photographs here with the light pipe. Actually, just two portraits. 
Um, again, I just showed or explained the, the classical use of these of the light pipe, but again, why not use it on a on a portrait as well? Um, not even in a car, just a normal portrait. And um, like this is shot with um, with a light pipe. You can see it in the eyes if I zoom in. And what you can see in the eyes as well is that the light pipe is not evenly lit. It's like it's like a heavily graduated softbox. And with this, of course, you can play. Um, you can adjust the illumination of the light pipe by focusing or defocusing the lamp head if it's a pulsar G, and decide how you want to have the the light distribution inside the light pipe. So in this situation, it's actually quite symmetrical over the entire setup. But as you can see in the eyes of the model, I chose that there is a lot of light, uh, a lot more light on the right, and then it's slowly, slowly fading away. And this creates the, the nice uh, wrap around around the nose. This creates the, the nice shadows in the photograph. So in, in the end, both balloon and light pipe, um, they offer you uh, a main light and the feeling light in one, and mainly th th it makes a lot of sense if they are used in reflective environment and the light pipe especially uh, beneficial in narrow environments because it really doesn't take a lot of space. Right, ring flash, and the next one I would like to talk about. So the ring flash, I show it here with an accessory. It's the, the beauty adapter for the ring flash that just amplifies the size of the ring flash. So it makes the, the light of the ring flash a little bit softer. It's like using a bigger softbox in portraiture. So why would you use a bigger softbox in portraiture? Because you would like to have a softer light. You would like to have um, uh, less reflections maybe on the skin and so on. So we do nothing else than distribute the light energy on a bigger area. This makes the light less aggressive. Nevertheless, me personally, I use it i would say 100 percent of the applications i use it just open so we take the beauty reflector away and i put on the normal reflector like that now it's very hard it's harder than a p70 reflector because it has more or less the same size but of course there's some light missing in the center so it's even harder but it will not create any harsh shadows because of course i shoot through the uh, ring flash so it's a very hard but shadowless light. And this, in my eyes, is the best, I think one of the best possible fill-in lights. So I almost never use the ring flash as a main light because it's, a, it's always the same in the end, okay? You, you, you do not play with the, uh, with the angle or whatever. So it's always the same, but using it as a, as a fill-in light, it really makes it an amazing tool, not only for portraiture, but as well for um, still lifes, like in this situation, a very large still life. Uh, if I share the screen, you see it as well what I talk about. So the entire setup looks like this. So just a lot of um, area lights that work out the, the chrome parts, uh, a light pipe here as well vertically just uh, to do uh, for the, the back tire a little bit, a couple of spots. But actually there's no real fill-in light here. The fill-in light, you don't see it in the, in the, in the behind the scenes shot because it's the ring flash and the, the camera is out of the shot. But the, the final looks like this. And now if we zoom in, you can see the effect of the ring flash. So the ring flash is the light that goes in here. There's no spot, there's no softbox, no gradation that goes there, but the ring flash goes to the even most hidden part of the shot. So there's nothing remaining completely in the dark when you use a ring flash as a fill-in light. It's not the main light here. It's just uh, several f-stops below the general exposure, just a little bit of um, illumination. The price you pay for it are, are these little highlights, like here, but they are very easy to retouch. If I go over the shot in 10 minutes, all these uh, possibly disturbing highlights here are uh, are taken care of. But uh, in this area, like in here, um, this would just be a complete a black hole. There would be nothing there. The ring flash being a hard light 
brings some reflections in there, brings texture in there. So that's why in portraiture, in fashion photography, as well as in uh, in uh, still life photography like this uh, motorbike here, I like to use the ring flash a lot as an additional light, as a fill-in light. Exactly. Okay, so again, one more a portrait. So here again, ring flash as a fill-in light, and you see how beautifully it works out the texture of the skin. Okay, super, super selective focus. Uh, yeah, super selective focus here. And being a hard light, it brings life into the shadows. It just, it, it does not flatten the shadows like a diffused filling light or like a too large a soft box. So it really brings the life, uh, the skin alive, even in the darkest shadows. Then we have the pulse spot four. The last one for the second round, then I would like to have a, a quick look at the, the questions again. Let me um, open you uh, a couple of photographs first, just in order to win a little bit of time here. All right, that's not the one I want to start with. Maybe that's the one uh, I want to start with. So here I used the, the uh, uh, Pulse Spot 4 with the templates illuminating just a part of the egg. The result looks like this. So comparable maybe to the, the, the Picolite with break attachments, unbelievable precision of the light. You can illuminate the pixels or the, the, the object actually almost like pixel wise. Put this one away and yeah. Um, here the, the pulse spot four, again with the templates only illuminates the water that's actually in front of the model. There we have here on the hand and on the on the on the on the finger, we have a little bit of direct light from the pulse spot for hitting her, but all the rest, what you see on her face, on the body, these are all reflections. It's very important that if we want to work with reflections of the water, that we have a hard light hitting the water, otherwise the, the, the reflections are not clear. But I don't want this hard light on the model's face, of course. So that's why I can make a very precise border with the templates and only illuminate the, the water with hard lights and the, the rest of the, the body is actually illuminated with a, with a bluish filtered diffused light. But like this, we get all these texture, all these uh, pleasant reflections of the water on the model skin. Compared to the Pico light with projecting attachment, the Pulse Spot 4 can definitely be used for larger sets like um, full body sets or even more like here, the dancer actually jumping into this uh, aperture mask, this round aperture mask that I'm projecting uh, to the to the wall actually. What you see here, what looks like the floor is actually a studio wall and the, the model is just uh, jumping into the circle of light. Super sharp shadows as I explained before, uh, as sharp as with a sunlight set maybe, extremely precise light. And then last but not least, I can not only project some, um, let's say, templates as well. I can, for example, put in a slide and project a slide onto any surface on the background or in this situation to a body. And it looks like a, a full body tattoo, but it's actually a slide of a church uh, or the church in Barcelona that I project onto this model's back. So a lot of creative uh, potential, but as well a lot of problems solved thanks to the Pulse Spot 4. I'm sharing the screen, just that you have seen it. So that's it. That's the, the Pulse Spot 4. That's as well one of the lights that's definitely always here in the studio. Um, I use it not on a daily basis, but it's always like a, a choker when I have a photographic problem somewhere. That's most of the time the solution. Pulse Spot 4 actually is, first of all, it's a Fresnel spot. So you can take the projecting attachment. All the pictures you have seen before are done with the projecting attachment. You can take this one away and then you can put here a Fresnel. So uh, it's actually a native Fresnel spot, but you can take the Fresnel lens away and put the projecting attachment there. Right, this about this one, which means it's time for questions. I see one. Okay, is the ring flash P the same with just different mounting brackets? Um, 
Yes, also the housing of the ring flash P. So this one is the ring flash C. C stands for camera, ring flash P stands for para. In the earlier paras, um, it was actually beneficial to use a, a ring flash inside the para to have a more even illumination. Uh, the housing of the lamp head was the same, but it was not um, such a reflector, but it was just a projecting uh, protection glass. It was just round that we have a more open light angle inside the para that um, if I use it here as a lamp head to illuminate the para that we have as, as well light going up and down, left and right, that we actually illuminate the, the entire para evenly. Uh, right now, there is still an adapter that you can use your, your ring flash P inside the para, but um, now as the lamp head is at the perfect position inside the para, we don't really need this anymore. Okay, as I said, it was uh, it was for the for, for the earlier paras, uh, precisely the para F uh, front focus. There, it was beneficial to have the the ring flash P as a light source inside the para. But now, this is uh, this is not necessary anymore. Okay, question window is empty, which means I can start um, with the last three, maybe fifty more minutes. I'm late as always. UV attachment, that's the black one. Black because there's no visible light uh, coming through. So everything from 400 all the way up to 700 nanometers is blocked. There is, however, there is UV light um, coming out of it. Um, it's a good idea to take away the protecting glass if you use uh, the UV attachment. So just the, the, the black indicator line is on the top, then we can, can take this away uh, controlled. Uh, the, one of the, the jobs of, the, of this protecting glass, of course, is to block UV light, that we don't have any strange color temperature shift on, on our objects. But if we block the UV light and then we block the rest, of course, there's nothing left. So we take the protecting glass off and now we can put on the UV um, attachment and now we have here uh, just the UV light coming out, the visible light is blocked. Um, what can we use this for? Of course, it, it, we need something, um, some UV active surfaces in our shot. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense at all. So let me show you three examples with this. I'm taking them to Photoshop and share this window again with you. All right, the first shot I'm going to show to you is uh, the, the only photograph that's not shot by me uh, from what I'm showing today. It's a photograph taken by David Sheldrake based in London. If you want to read the entire article about his UV photography, again, you go to the Bronkler website, you, uh, you search for David Eldrick and you find the story about this. Of course, it's with uh, UV um, um, makeup here as, as well, uh, UV active material in the hair and you can create uh, effects like this. Very, very nice series that he photographed. Um, just a very simple shot that illustrates what UV attachment is doing. So here, no visible light on the model, just some a normal flash on the background and nothing but UV light on her. So it leaves the, the body completely um, black, only that the white underwear uh, actually shows. Uh, shows up and we can as well use this a little bit more decent, a little bit more precise. So this um, kind of advertising shot for white underwear is as well uh, filled in. Here, the, the UV light is only fill in light uh, because you can see that the, the model's body on the camera side is uh, almost completely black. And if I have no additional light on the on, on, on the bra and on, on the panties, of course, they would look uh, rather like uh, grayish, dark grayish, would look very dirty. So it would not be a good advertising shot for white underwear, okay? So I just did add a little bit of UV light to, to bring out the, the, the brilliance and the, 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 the white of this uh, UV um, material, of this UV active material. Of course, it only works on, on, white, uh, on white garment, let's say, if you have um, yeah, other colors, it would 
not have the same effect. Right. Good. This was the UV. Let me check. Sunlight set would be next. I would as well show you on the lamp pad quickly what the sunlight set is. Let me come here again because it's we are already halfway there because we already took off the protecting glass and now we take off the flash tube. Whenever you start manipulating on the modeling light or the flash tube, make sure that it's unplugged. Huh? So very important. Now, um, it's never wrong to, to use uh, a gloves or to use a, a textile like a t-shirt. Here, however, I have uh, the, the flash tube has a socket. And if I really make sure that my fingers are only touching the socket, I can take it away as well uh, without gloves, just like that. And I'm changing the flash tube to the flash tube that comes together with the sunlight set. And if I direct uh, the flash tube towards the, the object, like you are the models now, it, it's almost like a point light source. So we make the light harder like that. Again, do not touch this, uh, the, the, the glass, because first of all, the, the fat of your, of your fingers can burn in, uh, in the glass. And of course you can break it as well. It's quite fragile. So, but if we, if we touch the socket only, this works perfectly put this in, the, the spring is fixing it. And here as well, we have, of course, the small protecting glass does not fit, but this one does. And now we have a, a very, very hard light source, like the sunlight. Okay, that's why it's called sunlight set. Now, um, the light, actually, if you look at the shape, there's a lot of light leaving left and right, but there's only a, a reduced amount hitting the object directly. And this is very interesting because if we have the corresponding barn doors with it, we can control the amount of indirect light. I, I explained it before with the, with the balloon. With the balloon, we do it over the distance. Here, we do not have to change the position of the um, sunlight set within the studio, but we can change the amount of indirect light with the barn doors. So if we open it, there's a lot of light coming indirectly. So we have very low contrast. The light remains hard, but in low contrast. If we close, of course, the light is still hard, but now additionally with very high contrast. So we have here as well, once again, uh, main light and fill-in light, diffused fill-in light combined in one light shaper. What does this do to your photographs? Let me open here the, the, the pictures only. I mean, you can imagine how the egg looks like. So that's why I'm going to open something else. I'm going to open here the picture of a, of a design chair that I shot a couple of weeks ago. Does it show up? Yes, it does show up. So um, of course, in the photograph, you see the shadows of two chairs. And the first shadow of the chair that you see in the picture, the, the chair is very close in front of the background. So these shadows are absolutely sharp. However, there is another chair far away from the background, just in front of the sunlight set. And of course, these shadows are uh, much softer, even if we have something close to point light source. Now, when I saw the picture, I kind of liked these uh, snake-like um, shadows around because it really supports the, the, the shape of the, the chair and everything. If you don't want this, if you want to have even shadows, you can take away the, matte, uh, the, the clear protecting glass and you can use a matte protecting glass on the sunlight set so that the shadows are somewhat softer, but at least they are even. The setup behind this photograph, let me show it to you again totally. The setup behind it looks like this. So just one main light, the, the sunlight set down here with the barn doors closed that I have the highest possible contrast. So this light is responsible for both shadows and then um, just two normal reflectors with honeycomb grids to work out a little bit more reflections, a little bit more shape on the chair itself. So that's the setup, that's the final result. Very nice light shaper. Okay, put this away. And 
we go for the last one, the biggest one as promised. So we have um, just a couple of minutes uh, to talk about the PARA. That's of course not sufficient uh, on the PARA. I need at least uh, two hours of your attention to explain it from from the very beginning to the to the very end. Uh, just um, I would like to show you a little bit how you, you can think, how you can start thinking about the PARA, but it really, it's probably the most complex light shaper of everything shown today. Um, I would like to, to let you see the light distribution. I would like to have to, to move it around a little bit. And Manuel, can I ask you to put, to press the, the red button on the lampet? Yeah, exactly. So if, if I have um, the, the strong light illuminating the scene, you will not see what I'm doing. So, but like this, it should be possible. All right, good. So, the most important parameter when working with the PARA, of course, is the, the focus position. Let me take it a little bit closer to you. So, it's a parabolic light, and this means if the lampet is in the focus point, the light leaves the, uh, the PARA more or less parallel. So, it's like a huge spot. It's like it's comparable to a Fresnel with about two meters diameter. Okay, so the light leaves parallel and you can, you can have a lot of light over large, large distances. If I focus it, it will almost burn here the webcam, but you will see the light distribution goes like that. Huh? And now, of course, the webcam compensates, so it's so bright that I, I'm completely black. Okay, so, uh, and now that the light, you, you, you get easily an f-stop 16 or even uh, 16 and a half over 10 or even more meters. So, if you need to illuminate, for example, let me switch this off so you can see a little bit what's going on. If you have to illuminate a big fashion setup, let's say with several models in the set, you cannot do this with a, with a softbox because the softbox, the light of a softbox falls off very, very fast. And if you take the softbox further away, there's no light left on the, on the scene. So the power, you can take it away 10, 15, 20 meters. You focus it and you have a, a large area um, almost with no light fall off. So that's how me personally I use it uh, when it's focused. In the studio, however, most of the time I use it defocused, which means the lamp head comes out. And now it's very sensitive on the on the distance of the camera. For example, if it's completely defocused, like in this situation, the, some of the reflections are or would be out here, but there's no more power out there. So I have to refocus it a little bit. Exactly, and you see that now I move these reflections to the last end, so somewhere around here. It's the perfect defocus position for the position of the camera, okay? So if you are the models, this would be the position I would use it. Why? The, the, the light is now far away from the center. The light only comes here from the peripheric, and there's no, let's say, flat light or no boring light coming from the camera axis. And this is a light that perfect, perfectly wraps around an object. All these 24 reflections are, of course, hitting the model's center, but what's coming here from the right will not hit the model's left. What's coming from the left will not hit the model's right. So we will have a natural automatic gradations towards the edge of the model. You will see this in a, in a photograph right later on. And so the, the thing is always to go to the model's position, look back and choose the best possible um, lamp head position within the reflector. It's very sensitive on distances. It's as well sensitive on, uh, on angles, yes. What do we do if we would like to have this light coming not, let's say, um, symmetrically from the center, but what do we do if we want to have this light coming from the left, maybe? Do we have to move the entire power to the left? No, we don't. We just have to tilt it a little bit like that. Okay. Now, by doing this, you see this is symmetrical. And when I tilt it a little bit, this side becomes much more active. There's much more reflections here. Well, here the reflections are falling out of the power. So we have now all of a sudden the light comes from the left. And then you yeah, but actually the, the chocolate side from the model is more the other side. So again, no big change. Just move the power to that side, and all of a sudden, all the light comes, or most of the light comes from there. So with the 
Just the angle, once again, main light and filling light in one, with nothing else than the angle. It's a very light, a very complex lighting system. So it's not uh, like, a, I don't know, there, there's actually nothing, nothing basic, like a, even a softbox or something like this. It can be very complex, but the power is really uh, special. You really have to be very open-minded if you start working with the power, play with the distances, play with the focus, play with the angles. Uh, maybe even with honeycomb grids are available for a power, three different diffusers. So it's really by itself a very complex lighting system. But if you know what it does, um, it's solving most of your photographic problems. Last but not least, before I go with the last, uh, yes, please, before I go um, with the last um, round of questions, let me open here um, a few photographs taken with Para. Share the screen one more time with you guys. Okay, let's start with the the one I was just talking about. So this one, so this uh, white fashion on the white background. Uh, of course, I have additional light on the background, but on the model is nothing else but a para. And if you zoom in, um, it's very very easy to do this. You just have to make take care that the exposure here in the center of the body is correct, and then the gradations to both sides you get this for free. Okay, here as well on the shoulders, it's just a beautiful wrap around all around. This, of course, works as well if the model is moving, constantly moving, dancing. If you have more than one model in the setup, always works perfectly. Great background as well. Of course, always nice to work with the reflections in the glasses here or as well uh, in, the, in the eyes. In here, it's, uh, it's focused. So that's why the entire power is illuminated. When you defocus it, you get more like a ring flash effect in the eyes. And this um, illustrates what you can do with the power if it's focused. I can actually make this a little bigger. Unfortunately, I have only low res picture here, but um, um, it's absolutely sharp. Um, when, I, when I shoot this guy flying through the air, of course, once I shoot him a little bit more on the right, a little bit more on the left, so I have to illuminate a setup of, uh, of several meters. I cannot uh, um, fix everything to, to just a couple of centimeters because um, my finger is just not fast or precise enough. So this means the light has to be quite far away. At the same time, the light has to be powerful enough to dominate daylight here. It's uh, in, in the middle of, the, of an afternoon in, in the Netherlands on, on a sunny day in the Netherlands, which does not happen too often. And um, at the same time, I should avoid to work at full power. So even at reduced power, I have plenty of light. Reduced power is important that I can work with a short flash duration and freeze such a fast moving object. Right, so as I said, this was very, very quickly about the para. There is, um, on our website, there are, uh, they actually have the link to, to 31 how-to videos that we produced in cooperation with uh, Carl Taylor. And one of these videos is, uh, it's called uh, White on White, and this explains uh, much more precisely what you can do with different sizes, with different distances, with different angles, and so on and so on. It explains very carefully what you can do with, with, the, with the angles, creating side lights. So if you want to learn more about the para, that's the, the way to do. Anyway, on our website, in the learn section, there are a lot of stories. There are a lot of how-to photographs with behind the scenes uh, pictures. And at the moment, we have a total of 31 how-to videos explaining different lighting situations. Right, um, last question, probably. How different is the spot attachment for Pulso mount compared to a Pulso Spot 4? Is there also a Fresnel spot attachment? Can it be used with Ciros? Asking for a friend, yes. Okay, got this. Um, okay, the difference between the spot attachment and the Pulso Spot 4, it's the same, the same idea. So we are talking about this solution and something similar, let's say as well, uh, optical snoot, but that can be used with a, a standard lamp head like a Pulsar G or Unilight. 
Um, they have the same light characteristic, but with the, the spot attachment, you will never reach the, the light precision of the Pulsar Spot 4, because in here we have a special flash tube. We have a point light sourced flash tube, and if you have a point light source, it's always easier to, to deal with the light later on. So we have a special light source in here, and if you work with the with the adapter solution, there's always the the round trip uh, via a matte protecting glass. So we are first uh, making a more even uh, light source by using a matte protecting glass, and then we have to deal with a larger with a larger light source. And of course, that that's never as precise. So if you would like to create something like a, a theatrical effect in your studio, the Pull so no, the spot attachment is absolutely fine, but you will have a little bit of uh, color rendering at the edges. And uh, if you want to project gobos or slides, it will never be as sharp as with the pulsar spot four. So that's if you really want to have the 100% of the of the possible quality, that's the only solution. Any suggestion suggestions of the most versatile modifier to pack to a restaurant shooting. Um, whenever I have to be flexible, I always take the same things with me. These are a um, couple of lights. Restaurant shooting depends on how big the setup, uh, setup are, maybe three, four lights. Normal reflector, honeycomb grids, and a couple of, and a nice choice of soft boxes. With this, I can do almost everything. I can take everything away. I can work with a, with a diffused light. And then I can put um, spots maybe with uh, with my honeycomb grids. If I have to uh, create like a window light, I have my soft boxes with me as a basic light. Of course, as well, the balloon is a, is a possibility. If it's a, if, if you have to shoot the entire interior of this uh, of this uh, restaurant, the balloon would be a good option. Um, but um, when I have to be flexible, me personally, I don't take too many of such a very sophisticated light shapers I go for for the basics, uh, which means normal reflector, honeycomb grids, uh, bare bulb is, a, is an option, and uh, two or three different sizes of soft boxes. Right. Okay. So this was it. Uh, I see the window about questions is empty. I tried to speed up a little bit, but it took me on the minute exactly as long as in the morning. So there's just no way to do it faster if I, uh, because we have so many interesting light shapes around. So I apologize for the delay. I would like to thank you very much for, the, uh, for spending this time uh, with us today. If, however, there's a, another question, coming up right now after we finish the session remember that on friday afternoon 2 p.m i will be back here in the studio us, uh, answering your questions about lighting and if you're interested in a live webinar seeing me shooting a commercial uh, shot here in the studio this happens next week so this would be the 22nd last webinar of the series of 10 here from the studio commercial photography that's it for now. Thank you very much for your time. All the best. Bye-bye.